Review scores have always been a contested form of criticism. On one hand, it's a quick and easily accessible resource that can allow buyers to make snap decisions. People who are smart enough to check a review before buying a new game for their child or cousin will find these resources especially useful. The clean number on a review also appeals to the OCD side in all of us. Being able to quantify what games outscore another allows us to make nice lists. But that right there can be a problem. While scores are a good way to compose general thoughts on a game, they only do just that. Generalize. A 6 can mean many different things depending on the person you're asking. 6s are so close to average that some would say they're not worth your time. A 6 could be seen as a flat out good game, just coming with some baggage. Or a 6 in the case of IGN or GameSpot is nothing a consumer should touch, since the average game rates at about a high 7 to a low 8. There are two points I want to talk about here. One, I believe no game can simply be quantified by a number. We can get a general idea of quality if a game scores consistently high or low numbers, but we will never get the full picture. Sure, Daisy, in its initial modded state, was a blast for many players to play. But it doesn't discount the fact that the game ran like shit, which could easily turn into an instant turnoff for many players. Personal preference and taste heavily changes one's enjoyment of a product. I imagine many people are bored sick of the zombie genre as a whole. But as someone who still finds them fascinating and engaging, I would welcome more and was ecstatic for the launch of Days Gone, which is in contrast of critic reviews. The reason you, the viewer, are even watching this video is due to some form of preference. Whether it's the topic of the video, or if it's the enjoyment slash trust you may have from my content, regardless, you are here to watch this video for some reason. This leads me to my second point, fun. Fun is something you can't necessarily track. Sure, I can say Bloodborne's levels are well designed, but does that automatically make it fun? To some, it's a factor that makes it more enjoyable. To others, it might be downright frustrating. So this bad score attached to this bad game doesn't mean this game isn't fun, because that's in the eye of the beholder. All this brings me to my main topic today, Operation Raccoon City, other known as Resident Evil Orc. I don't disagree with these scores. On an objective level, this is a bad game, and it found itself perpetuating that poorly done action phase Resident Evil went through. I'm not saying 4 and 5 are bad games, being the first titles to usher in the action. Simply myself and many others thought that they were downplaying one of Resident Evil's biggest assets, Orc. For those not in the know, Resident Evil Orc was a 4 player co-op based, over the shoulder third person shooter made by the same guys who made a few installments of the SOCOM series. Capcom trusted Slant 6 games with arguably their best-selling franchise, something that kind of baffles me today. Slant 6 games had made only three games before working on Orc, two of which were made for the PSP. Taking a quick look back at these titles shows a little promise. Tactical Strike has the player control multiple squad members at once and it promoted a slower playstyle, one that could have meshed well with the Resident Evil's generally slow enemies. Unfortunately, we got something different. Something a little more generic. Something a little more third person. Something with cover shooting, just how the late 2000s would have wanted it. Orc has really stiff controls. This is most apparent with movement in general. There's an obvious amount of lag between any inputs that aren't simply walking or turning. Sprints require the L3 button to be pressed. Following a brief delay, the player's movement is heavily restricted, and the player cannot run freely, instead sprinting in slight angles. It feels like a slightly looser version of tank controls, since you have to commit to a direction wherever you sprint. Dodges are very unreliable since they require a sprint to be activated first, meaning a player must press the L3 button, wait for the sprint animation to start, input a direction, then press the dodge button. This is a process that takes 1-2 to two seconds to complete, making the dodge very unreliable and very laggy to use. This is only really a problem with the tougher enemies like the BOWs and the tyrants, but bleeding effects often tied to these enemies can cause a snowball effect. Players will be unable to move due to the horde that the bleeding attracts, and BOWs will land more free hits inflicting more bleed. The military based soldiers also inflict quick damage on the player. 
with bleed being a very common effect tied to their guns. All this prompts the player to use the cover liberally placed on every level. One of my favorite features is the fact that you don't have to press a button, but you simply just walk up to a wall, bench, or barrier, and your character will quick duck in place on their own. This can be a little frustrating when walking through tight corridors as your character will begin to stick to walls like glue, but that's the farthest thing from janky that you will find in this game. One of the more baffling aspects of Orc is a lack of recovering health over time. Most cover-based shooters incorporate this mechanic since the player will almost definitely take damage in and out of cover. In Gears of War, the player takes damage efficiently and quickly from any enemies if they're caught out of line. Same thing happens in Orc. But instead, all health is recovered through herb drops on the ground and first aid sprays. The reason I call this puzzling is because damage is thrown at the player constantly. Military men deal lots of damage, tyrants and BOWs deal lots of damage, and hordes can certainly pile on as well if someone gets the bleed effect attached to them. Class abilities and specials can help alleviate these problems a little bit. The assault class has an unlockable ability that gives the player invulnerability, allowing them to mow down targets outside of cover. Recon classes can cloak, and AI will never be able to spot them. And the Demolition has defensive mines and AoE zombie clearing abilities. Some of these skills unfortunately aren't useful unless playing in the PvP multiplayer modes, especially the surveillance based classes. The multiplayer modes are unsurprisingly not populated today, which makes these classes hard to have fun with on the normal campaign. Lastly, there is a tiny homage on the auto aim function of the pistols. I believe they were trying to copy the animations from the original games. It was a puzzling decision, but I believe they added it so players wouldn't be overwhelmed when swarmed by zombies, as it does do a good job of clearing the way. I think the main reason regen wasn't allowed in the game was because of the existence of bosses. Orc bosses all have three similar aspects about them. One, they deal tons of damage and bleed which will summon large amounts of zombies to swarm the player. The final boss in particular can one-shot the player at any time if they get into melee range. Two, all bosses are damaged sponges, being able to take multiple shots to the face without even flinching. This would make sense with the Nemesis fight, but not so much from an aging Nikolai. And three, the best plan of attack is to attack the boss from as far as possible with either a sniper rifle or a pistol. Boss fights turn less into a form of skill expression, like they are typically meant to be, and instead turns into a hiding in a corner match while taking pot shots at the boss. The Tyrant fight and the Welkin fight change this formula a little bit, but those battles come down to shoot the glowing body part and avoid damage as much as possible, another task that really isn't all that engaging. Shooting zombies is another story though. Limbs break off easily, and as long as you are aiming at the head, they go down quickly. Mopping up hordes is an enjoyable task, though ammo can be a little bit on the scare side at times. I often found myself enjoying the filler between set pieces as the most enjoyable parts of the game, since roleplaying as a cleanup crew, fighting off other military based squads in a devastated city, was a lot more engaging and fun compared to the restrictive action bits. Orc's story and character backgrounds were ambitious to say the least. Orc isn't a canon game, rather it's a what if scenario. Something that's a bit of a shame since a lot of the ideas and sequences were quite interesting. The Wolf Pack, other known as the USS Delta Squad, is a group of six individuals, all with their specific roles and backstories. For example, Lupo was a decorated French soldier turned housewife. After having killed her husband for abusing her children, she found herself unable to adapt to civilized society, instead finding both comfort and payment as part of Umbrella's secret service. She's the squad leader and is often referred to as the Mother Wolf. She focuses on assault-based skills to protect her team. Small bits of personality were put into these members, not as much as normal RE protagonists, but enough to keep you invested and to understand banter between the bunch. What's most interesting is that much like the company that hired them, they all come from shady backgrounds, usually being unable to adapt to a normal life and instead looking for a way out with a questionable company. 
Their distrust for one another is apparent and understandable throughout the game, since in the end, they all are just mercenaries. Are you gonna make it? Get your hands off of me. Orc's story works out like this. After failing to acquire the G-Virus sample from William Birkin, the Umbrella Corporation blames the outbreak on the USS Delta Squad and forces them to do cleanup tasks in exchange for extraction. Destroying evidence, fighting off Nikolai, shutting the city's power off, and killing any survivors. The plot works as a way of showing off what was going on in the background, since they primarily interact with side characters or show up in events happening off screen from the original RE2. Well, that would have been true, except for this instance. I'm not one of those things. Stop shooting. And the final mission of the game, where the player comes into direct contact with Leon. And in the final mission, it includes a whole new segment, where they chase him down in a train yard. Not only is the US government trying to help Leon, but the player is even given the option to kill Leon and subsequently Claire Redfield as well. Despite this making the entire story non-canon, there's still an interesting choice at the end, potentially putting teammates against each other, whether they decide to save Leon or kill him. Orc was really close to an interesting side story, one that could have coexisted with the canon of RE2 and RE3. The problem though was that fan service was the top priority, and here we are today. Sorry. We've got orders. Orc is an action game through and through. All levels include some form of military that needs to be shot, cover to hide behind, and zero exploration, instead being guided by an all-knowing voice from Umbrella. Zombies are a factor, but mostly placed as filler, rather than being a real threat to the player. Only during two missions is the horror really kicked up the town hall mission, and the hospital. They do a decent job, but the overall rest of the game drowns out these sparse moments. The game does look dated, but that's not surprising coming from a game that's seven years old. All of my footage comes from the Xbox 360 edition, so don't be too surprised if you've seen some screen tearing. Populated rooms like this one with Nemesis or this train yard can experience some heavy frame drops as well. There isn't a ton here that's really all that great, or at least memorable except for the amazing character designs. The Umbrella Secret Service soldiers were meant to look badass, mysterious, and unified, something they achieved through a quick few clothing tricks. Every character has a gas mask, which hides four out of the six faces. The use of black and blue on all uniforms while not being very practical brings the unifying look to each member since individually, they are all very unique, and their costumes tell all the story about them. Beltway, for example, is missing a foot from an explosives accident, much like his demolition class. Vector hides his appearance with a hoodie, much like someone who would want to do if they were on a recon mission. Lastly, Spectre has a large eyewear, something a surveillance expert might be interested in. I can't say the same for their Spec Ops counterparts all of which look like boring military bros and girls. The only one that even slightly interested me was the medic, and that was because his sunglasses were on the back of his head. Like, who the fuck does that? Most of what I've said here today has been negative, and I wouldn't recommend you touch this game unless you come across it for about $5. Right now, it's still going for a whopping 30, when the game itself only has around $15 worth of content. So I think the question becomes, why did I even bother writing a script? Why did I even try to show this game off to you guys? Because it's fun. I don't like throwing around the idea of turning your brain off, because I think it's an excuse for something that's bad. But I don't have to think hard in this game, and I just have fun. I think it's mostly the setting. Cleaning up the streets of hoarding zombies and fighting off other militarized squads is a blast, especially when you discover bleed effects can also be applied to enemies, causing them to be sworn. The chaos of the situation is great, and the game attempts to switch things up with a large choice of guns. Most of these guns are slight stat changes from one another, but there are a few special ones like the Tommy Gun, which has an insanely long clip. I know it's dead, but when this game was still fresh, its multiplayer was genuinely fun. Everyone was fragile and died fast, but it still meant that everyone could kill you fast, and you could kill each other quickly, so everyone was dangerous. I was horrible at the game, but using the assault class means I still got a guaranteed kill with the invulnerability, 
The field scientist class can control any BOW, including a tyrant, and recons get guaranteed execution kills with the cloaking ability. To say the least, this game is broken. There are glitches, power imbalances, annoying mechanics, and unfortunately a dead community. But I still love this game. It's damn fun. And for me, it's the definition of a guilty pleasure. And after putting the numbers into the machine and calculating all my stats here, I give Operation Raccoon City a whopping, probably a waste of time out of 10.